Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you all coming to this session. Uh, my name is Hussein, and um, <clears throat> basically in this session I will try to um, explain you the um, experiences during the um, implementing a managed service. And basically, uh, we will issue two topics. One of them is the Kubernetes, and another of them is the microservices on top of this uh, Kubernetes environment. So about me, uh, currently, I am the technical team lead of the Hezekes Cloud, and um, uh, I have worked with different companies in, for um, their microservice and DevOps transition before. And I will try to sum up all of the things and uh, provide them <coughs> unified information to you. Uh, hopefully I can do that. Uh, in this session, uh, our outline will be about uh, first Kubernetes overview, uh, isolation, uh, multi-tenancy, because uh, we are, since we are developing a managed service, it should be somehow most probably multi-tenant environment. Uh, so you need to monitor your system in a very well manner. Um, of course, since this is a managed service, it should be something like, um, sorry for that. It should be public, so you have the black box environment in Kubernetes and how you move this one to the uh, public internet. So I will show you how to do that. So right after that, on top of Kubernetes environment, how you deploy your microservices, how you um, logging them, and finally APM and uh, um, service mesh uh, term inside the microservice environment. <coughs> So most probably you already know the Kubernetes, it is the open source platform for managing containers, workloads and services. Here, workloads mean um, a different kind of objects specified in the Kubernetes environment. Um, <clears throat> so in, in order to use Kubernetes environment, you have different kind of options. So one of them should be the cloud environment. Almost every of the cloud provider has a managed service. You can directly go input a couple of fields and then just create the Kubernetes environment. Or else, if you have an on-premise data center, you can use different kind of technologies like KubeSpray. Uh, for example, KubeSpray use the Ansible on the background. So you can define your hosts and just say KubeSpray that install Kubernetes all over this um, <coughs> specified uh, host. It is very easy to install these kind of things. So let's say that you selected a cloud environment to create a Kubernetes cluster. You, I assume you created it. So what about isolation here? Uh, basically, if you are using a Kubernetes environment, uh, you need to forget about the underlying infrastructure. Because let's say that if you want to expose a deployment to outside, when you create a service, it will create a load balancer. If it is a load balancer service, it will create the load balancer automatically uh, by the Kubernetes. If you are in the AWS, it will create the AWS load balancer. If you are inside the Azure environment, it will create the Azure load balancer. So you need to forget about this kind of infra level operations. <clears throat> and um, inside your company, let's say that there are different kind of environments for different purposes. Dev, staging, prod. It can be extended, by the way. This is just a simple example. And in order to isolate these environments, you can do different kind of this. The first one is uh, you can create separate Kubernetes clusters for different environments. For example, uh, one Kubernetes environment for dev, one for staging, and one for production environment. When you do this, actually, you need to tackle with different kind of Kubernetes contexts within your local or management uh, machine. <coughs> in second one, you can uh, install a huge giant Kubernetes cluster. And you can create different namespaces for different purposes. For example, dev namespace for dev environment, staging for staging, and prod namespace for prod environment. Since this is just an example, uh, sorry for that again. <clears throat> okay, since this is just an environment, it is prod, prod is here, but normally prod should be a separate Kubernetes cluster to separate with the uh, non prod environment. So when you do this, how to, um, how to isolate this kind of environment within your Kubernetes cluster? Let me talk about uh, this one. Um, <clears throat> when you have a look at, if you are the new learner of the Kubernetes environment, most probably you will deploy everything inside the default namespace, which is a bad practice. 
So you deployed microservices, you deployed cron jobs, maybe you deployed another monitoring tool, et cetera. Uh, when you list all of the posts or services, et cetera, you will see lots of things. So it will be bad to uh, analyze and see which, which for example, there can be two different pod starts with nearly same name, so you can do a bad thing to your critical pod, for example. In, or, in order to prevent this kind of things, please, um, you can create dedicated namespaces in order to deploy your um, object to different uh, namespace. For example, I created monitoring microservice and the worker namespace within my Kubernetes environment. And within monitoring namespace, I just put Prometheus, Grafana, and ANSI, which is the monitoring tools. If I want to do something with the monitoring, for example, I just wanted to add a configuration to a Prometheus uh, system. Uh, for example, alarm configuration. I just switch to the monitoring namespace and update my config map and apply it. That's all. Uh, let's say that I just wanted to see a couple of uh, Java-specific uh, environment specification inside a couple of service. I uh, switch my namespace to microservice one, do my operation, and that's all. Again, in the same strategy, if you have cron jobs, for example, Kubernetes cron jobs, you can deploy this one inside the worker namespace. So since you are using this <coughs> different namespace, you can put some different limitation according to this namespace. For example, you can put a limit to monitoring namespace uh, in order to restrict your environment. Uh, one example is one of the Prometheus components can increase in a dramatic way. So in order to restrict this one, you can put a namespace level restriction inside the Kubernetes environment. <clears throat> so if you are tackling the Kubernetes environment very uh, frequently, I just wanted to uh, propose you a couple of tools. One of them is kubesticks. Uh, in order to switch your name, uh, context, Kubernetes context, let's say that you have three or multiple Kubernetes environments, in order to switch your context, you can do this one, by the way, by using kubectl, but there is a long command. Instead of doing that, you can just use the kubesticks to switch your context. Another tool is kubeNS to switch your namespace. So um, it is developed one of the uh, Turkish developer, Ahmet, thanks for it. And in kubestick, as you can see, when you say kubestick, it lists the context. You just select one of them, and um, yeah, kubestick coffee, you switch to coffee context, and then list the pods. In same way, kubeNS lists the namespaces, just select one of them, and list the pods. So this is a bit older, but in the newer version, there is some FZF support. So when you say kubestick, you can search for the Kubernetes context or namespace. Context may be a bit, uh, a bit small than the namespace, but if you have lots of namespaces, you can use kubeNS and search your namespace within this command. But it is not stated here. <clears throat> so um, now you have a Kubernetes environment you install somewhere, and you are able to switch contexts and switch your namespaces, and you, you know how to use this Kubernetes environment. You separated. Uh, your Kubernetes clusters, or you have one Kubernetes cluster and different namespaces. But if you have different namespaces within the one Kubernetes cluster, you need to be very careful. So this is how multi-tenancy helps on this topic. <clears throat> um, let's say that you are trying to build a managed service. Most probably, you need to have only one system and you need to share your resources between your customers. But when you share something between customers, you will see that there will be lots of uh, security vulnerability will be introduced. In order to prevent this kind of situation, for example, when you have a look at the network policy example, network policy is a good component inside Kubernetes, helps you to isolate or put some network level restriction within your uh, system. When you have a look at here, you can say that um, <clears throat> Uh, this, this network policy helps you to um, allow connections from only the monitoring namespace. Let's say that you have lots of customers and they have some, for example, you are providing Hazelcast or Redis as a service within your SaaS product. And um, I just wanted to track your uh, Redis or Hazelcast pod for the specific customer. And in order to access this uh, Redis or Hazelcast, 
uh, the, my actual program resides in the monitoring namespace, so I just wanted to access these services. So in order to do that, I am putting an exception, saying that, okay, uh, within this namespace, C123, whatever it is, it, is, it can be any pod, uh, there can be only one connection from the monitoring namespace. This is the only allowed one. So if your application inside some, something like microservices namespace, you cannot access from microservice to this uh, C123 namespace. You need to be inside a monitoring namespace. There are lots of diff uh, complex um, strategy of this network policy, but there is only one concern here. If you plan to use network policy, you need to check your network driver within the Kubernetes environment. So network policy is only an abstraction, but according to your network driver, uh, CNI driver, so if you are using Calico, it will have different property set for you to apply these network policies. So you need to check it first. Uh, another example here. Um, <clears throat> so you provided a SaaS product. There is something inside the customer namespace, and naturally, it will want to connect to outside, right? Here, I am saying that, okay, anything within this namespace can connect to outside. But there is an exception here. As you can see, except one IP address. This is an example on the AWS environment. Let's say that you provide a SaaS service, and if customer tries to access this metadata API, it can get lots of metadata information from an environment. So, I am simply blocking this one. You can connect anywhere. You can connect Google. You can connect whatever API endpoint, but not this one because it contains some confidential data. <clears throat> so you have namespaces for your customers. This is the, so you can, by the way, you can create different Kubernetes clusters for your customers, but it will be very expensive. You need to, according to your needs, on my case, I am a public cloud as a service, a product. So I need to use my Kubernetes cluster as much as possible for my customers. So my main goal is utilize my environment as much as possible. In order to do that, you need to create namespaces and isolate them between each other. <clears throat> this is the, another important topic about managed services. Um, so uh, basically, we have two environments. One is control plane, and another is for data plane. Inside the control plane, basically, you have microservices, cron jobs, monitoring tools, et cetera. And um, in general, it is open to public, because you have API endpoints, you have some console, and this console should connect to the, these API endpoints, which is public. And inside the data plane, this is a black box. You cannot access this one directly from the outside, but or your control plane can connect to this one. Let's say that you have a microservice written in Spring Boot, and it, uh, it tries to orchestrate some, uh, again, Hazelcast or MySQL um, systems. So uh, your control plane is the only one that can connect to this data plane. This is the main point. So you shouldn't expose this data plane to outside, otherwise, all of your confidential endpoints should be open to public, which is bad. Instead of that, according to your reason or according to your uh, main um, goal, you can expose the specific ones. For example, if there is a Hazelcast inside it, you can expose only just dedicated port to the outside. Other than that, you should disallow everything, every incoming connection to this part. <clears throat> so, um, you have Kubernetes cluster, data plane, control plane, your microservices, cron jobs, et cetera, are ready. And you have data plane. You will see, if you are using Kubernetes and different Kubernetes clusters, you will see monitoring is very, very important because you have a huge environment and if there is something bad inside your environment, most probably you cannot know that. You need to set up this kind of monitoring system. But what is it actually? If you search on the Google about the monitoring on Kubernetes, most probably you will see this diagram. Basically, um, in my example, by the way, I, we are using Prometheus, which is open source monitoring uh, system. Within this monitoring, there are different kind of components. Basically, it has some alarm configurations, it has some push gateways, and <clears throat> it is capable of collecting different kind of metrics from different exporters. For example, if you have C-Advisor inside your Kubernetes cluster, most probably you have, and 
It can collect different kind of data from the C advisor and store this data inside this uh, PromDB. <clears throat> so, in order to use Prometheus, um, there are different kind of uh, strategy to install this one. You can install Prometheus manually, but when you do that, you need to set up your configurations manually on your own. And also, if you need some dashboard, for example, Grafana, again, you need to set up this one on your own. But most probably, you have heard about this operator term. Inside the Kubernetes, if you just want to deploy a couple of components at the same time in your system, you can search for the operator. For example, it can be Prometheus operator, maybe may Redis or MySQL operator. Um, here is a specific example. Um, Helm is the package manager for Kubernetes. In order to, uh, first I am adding the repo to my system, and then I install the operator, uh, Prometheus operator. When you do that, actually it installs every component needed inside the Prometheus system within the monitoring namespace. So most probably it will have Prometheus core, Promet node exporters, some Grafana installation. So it installed Prometheus, Grafana, and connects your Grafana to Prometheus directly. When you finish your installation, you can directly open the Grafana, and you can see uh, the, it, it connects to Prometheus as a source. And you will see a couple of predefined dashboards, like pod monitoring, cluster monitoring, node monitoring. And you can add different kind of dashboards to your Grafana after that. In order to... <clears throat> Visualize, uh, visualize your system, when you just install Prometheus, you will have a simple dashboard. So you can query metrics, and also you can see some graph data historically according to your metrics. But in most of the time, you will need a different, more advanced dashboard in order to uh, show some states to your colleagues or workers. Uh, this is just an example of Grafana connected, already connected to Prometheus source. Uh, as you can see here, you can see the cap Kubernetes capacity planning uh, dashboard. And <clears throat> as you can see, you can see here the system load, uh, idle CPUs, memory usage, and here you can see gauge um, um, graphs, memory usage, and disk usage space. When you use operator one, you can see these predefined uh, dashboards. But let's say that you are using SQS, you are using some Java services, so you can find different kind of open source dashboard within, when you search Grafana open source dashboards, you can list all of the dashboards already implemented by the community. <clears throat> One example on the alert manager, so you have lots of metrics, but if you are not using them, if you are not aggregating them, it is useless, okay? So you have metrics, it is time to alert your, I don't know, the team, entire team, according to some metrics. When you have a look at the first one, you can see, just alert me if there is a node unreachable for more, more than five minutes. This is very, very bad, but just an example. Uh, another example is, alert me if the average request latency is more than one second. If you have microservice pool, you have 100 microservices, this, this alarm can be the most important one because you, are, you need to track your API response latencies, request latencies, because most probably if you are a SaaS product, you need to provide an SLA to your customers. So this is also important. But how this delivered to entire team? It is another topic, so you can, Basically, in global, you define your destination. It can be email, it can be Slack, it can be Opschenny, for example. You can automatically trigger the incident inside the Opschenny. Uh, this is just the alarm part. Okay, this can be a quick question about this one. Uh, we said that you can have one Kubernetes cluster or multiple one. What if you have 10 Kubernetes clusters? Do you want to install these Prometheus operators on of them and monitor them separately? Or is there any other thing? So this is called Prometheus Federation. Basically, there is a central Prometheus uh, installation within one of the, your Kubernetes cluster, or it can be a separate one, by the way. Let's say that you set up a VM instance, you install this central Prometheus, this one, and inside your configuration, you just state your another Kubernetes cluster. So I am saying that I have only one Kubernetes cluster and there are three more in different regions. 
I state my uh, other Kubernetes clusters Prometheus URL, and then when you do this, actually your central Prometheus will try to follow, will try to track metrics from this extra Kubernetes clusters. So when you open your dashboard, you will see the metrics coming from different Kubernetes cluster, not only your Kubernetes cluster. Of course, you need to set up an authentication mechanism here. It can be a basic authentication in general. <clears throat> so until this point, uh, we try to state lots of things, but they are all for this simple dashboard. So you have microservices, Kubernetes environments, you are tracking uh, Beside the system metrics like Kubernetes disk, memory usage, CPU, et cetera, you can also write your own exporters, uh, Prometheus exporter to track your system. For example, if you have an, a Spring Boot application, you can track your um, actuator endpoints to get some kind of metrics and you can put them inside the Prometheus. And these metrics comes from the Prometheus API because we, we are already collecting the Hazelcast metrics exposed from the Hazelcast core, and then we are able to show all of them inside here very fast. So uh, we, <clears throat> we try to talk about the black box until this time because uh, we have services, uh, some uh, monitoring system, but none of them is up accessible from the outside. In order to access these services, these black box from the outside, you, again, you have different kind of strategies. But let's say that we are on cloud environment and we are inside the AWS. This is just an example. <clears throat> First of all, you need to define your entry point. In order to expose your Kubernetes nodes to outside, I mean the worker nodes to outside, you may use the Nginx ingress. This is the basic one if you want to expose something to outside. When you do this, actually, if you, for example, if you are inside the AWS environment, it will, it will create a simple load balancer for you. So it will be the entry point of your system. And we said that it will create a load balancer. It is time to point a C name inside your DNS registration. Let's say that I am using root 53. And inside the root 53, I, um, I define my domain name and saying that, OK, just add an entry for C name to this load balancer just created by the Nginx ingress. What if, if you are in an on-premise environment, there are different kind of technologies. For example, you can use uh, MetalB or other technologies in order to simulate this kind of load balancer creations. So you have load balancer, the request comes to your environment, but what if the service separation, when I type slash product, how the system knows that this slash product will go to product service? So this is handled by the ingress rules. When you have a look at this ingress rule definition, you will see, for example, for product service ingress, when you make a request with example.com, and if you have products slash product request, basically it will go to product service service, and it will use the 8080 port. Very simple. And as an overall picture, when you have a look at that, um, the request comes to a domain name, uh, which is root 53 on AWS. It will C name the request to load balancer. And within the load balancer, actually, you have Nginx um, ingress rules. And according to your ingress rule definition, the request proxy to necessary services on the background. If you type slash product, it will go to product service. It will type user slash user, it will go to user service. So uh, we have Kubernetes environment. We are able to monitoring it. We know how to expose this to outside. Now it is time to forget about the deployment part and then focus on the microservice, our business logic. <clears throat> so remember six or maybe five years ago, when you are using the monolithic application, actually it will take lots of time to deploy on production environment. Uh, I saw up to 45 minutes for, per, per instance, but maybe it, there is the bigger ones. But let's say that you change a product title and you need to wait lots of time to deploy on the production environment. And this is for only one instance. Uh, hopefully, after we switch to microservice architecture, everything is automatically resolved, right? So we, we separated our services, monolithic application, into different services. And unfortunately, it became this one. So you, you, you decompose your monolithic application into 100 microservices, and 
you started to handle this memory, let's say that you try to allow lots of memory, two gigabytes of memory, uh, one, 1,000 millicore CPU, you try, to di di uh, you try to distribute this kind of huge memories to your microservices because you haven't followed your, the best practices about the uh, microservice architecture. So in order to prevent this one, because it is very ex expensive, by the way, uh, let me give you only one example. You just started the Kubernetes uh, path, and you wanted to expose your service to outside by using the load balancer service type. Then you do this, and if you have 100 microservice, you will see that it will create 100 load balancer inside your AWS or other environments, and it will provide lots of bills at the end of each month. In order to um, prevent this kind of situation, let me provide you a couple of best practice. And the microservice architecture term cannot solve your problems. You need to apply a couple of best practice to do this. Uh, the microservices are like humans. So in order to have a good communication system inside your microservice, you need to have a good language, okay? Let's say that we are using REST APIs for your microservices. There is a model which is called Leonard Richardson model. It is about REST maturity. There are basically there are four levels here. Level one, you can think it is a swap service. Only one endpoint, you define your action within the XML envelope or request body. In level one, there are resources. So there is on, no only one endpoint. There are different kind of endpoints. But this time, you are using same HTTP method for every action. For example, you are using post method for everything, getting data, deleting data, or creating some data, which is wrong. And in level two, the HTTP verbs introduced. Here, actually, you are using different HTTP model methods for different actions. For example, you are using post for creating, delete for deleting, and get for getting some data, et cetera. This is good, by the way. If you are using this one, it is not bad. But there are the better one, the hypermeter controls. Inside this one, actually, you have some navigatable resources within your response. Let's say that I just returned the user data from the API, and I just wanted to go to the comments of this user. So there are two options. You can generate the URL on your own by using user, grab user ID and generate the URL, etc. Or you can embed your net possible destinations within your API response. For example, when you have a look at the GitHub APIs, you will see when you list the repository, you will see different kind of embedded links like next page, previous page, or um, a pull request, etc. This is very good because when you have navigatable resources, your mobile application, your front-end application, et cetera, will not uh, need to generate some URLs. Instead of doing that, it will just simply grab the part field and then try to go to that destination URL. <clears throat> um, so you have lots of microservices, but how about communication? Are you writing the HTTP? operations from scratch, or you are trying to use a client library. Okay, you can just use a client code generation system, but there are, I can provide two options. If you ever heard about the Fane client, uh, you can use Fane client in order to just simply define your interface. You will have a method signature, and by provide, for example, here, I am saying uh, get user is get method request. It simply goes to slash users. And it has a user ID parameter inside the URL. So inside of, instead of a concrete implementation, you can define your interface and a meta signature. And Fane Client will help you to act like a real client code library. And in Fane Client parameters like users, within the Kubernetes environment, you will never handle with the domain names, IP addresses, et cetera. Instead of you will use the service names because Kubernetes has some internal domain resolving mechanism. So service name is your domain name. Or you can add uh, Swagger inside your uh, application. Here, it is just a simple Java Spring Boot application. First, you just enable Swagger. When you do this, you will have two URLs. One of them is for API documentation, which is swagger-ui-html. Another of them is for API spec. This is important. The second part is important because uh, there is a library which is called Swagger CodeGen. Uh, if you execute the following command, java-jar, the 
uh, code against CLR jar. I am saying that just generate me a client code library by using this API spec URL, and it will be a Spring client code, and just export the output, generate the client code to this folder. This is very good, right? So if you have the correct good API REST services, your client code will be automatically generated. So you can directly use this one inside your client or consumer side applications. But what about automation on this part? If let's say that you just deploy an experimental feature on your non-prod environment, you can trigger another Jenkins job in order to trigger this client code generation, just take it with the snapshot version and put it into the artifactory. So by doing this, your client, your consumer will automatically use this one. Again, if you are on prod environment, you can again trigger another job right after the REST service deployment, and uh, it will take it with a stable version and just put it into the artifactory to distribute to your customers. So we have microservices, but what about adoption? How, how can we use this one inside the Kubernetes environment? Uh, this is just simple Golang application. Uh, within this application, as you can see, there is some app folder that contains business logic. Uh, there is Kubernetes related folder and a couple of Docker file, Jenkins file, and the, uh, some bash script to automate our deployment. So we set Kubernetes related files. When you have a look at this deployment file, you can easily see that uh, there is image URLs inside the container section. There is a replica set. So replica three means that there will be three pod instances for this deployment every time. Docker image, so you need to bake your image first and then try to deploy this one, by the way. I assume that you already baked, you already built your image. And you are saying that there is some uh, environment variable which is mongohost and some URLs. But what about exposing this to outside? This is a load balancer example, but in normal way, we are using node port or some cluster IP because there is Nginx ingress, there will be one load balancer, and the request will be distributed to services by using ingress rules. And here you are saying that my service is exposed to outside within the 80 port, 80 port, and it will be proxy to the 3000 port on the background during the proxy operation. Uh, so, uh, Again, I assume that you already configured your kubectl in order to do some operation. And basically, you clone your project, go into your project, and then apply the Kubernetes related folder. Whatever there is inside folder, service YAML, and deployment YAML will be automatically applied to, will be created and sent to the Kubernetes API master endpoint. What about confidential data? So you said you, you see the Mong host, for example, if you are using Spring Boot uh, REST service, what about injecting the database password or some other confidential data? So you can create a secret. I am saying that within the microservice namespace, just create a secret, and this DB password most probably comes from your Jenkins. You can use credential binding plugin in order to inject this one into your Jenkins pipeline or you can use some other vault tools inside your Kubernetes environment. There are different kinds of options. But do not use this confidential data right in your, uh, the environment variable as a static value. As you can see here, the first one, Spring Data Source username is the static one, but when you see, uh, look at the data source password, you will see it comes from the secret. <coughs> the secret name is product service, and the key is the DB password. Deployment strategies. So here, basically, when you send some changes to Git repository, it basically will, be, will trigger a Jenkins job, if you are using Jenkins, of course. It will build, test, and deploy the cloud environment. But what about the strategies? For example, I said there is a Jenkins file. When you have a look at this Jenkins file, you will see it clones the project, build first, uh, it, it do a test, and after that, it use a uh, bash script to deploy uh, this application to Kubernetes environment. So I have used base script because I just don't, didn't want to put some complex logic inside the Jenkins file. <clears throat> in order to have a pro proactive environment, it will be best to always notify yourself on any kind of destination. You can use Slack to notify yourself about Jenkins job status. In the deployment script, basically, I built my image 
I tag it, I push it to Docker registry, and then apply the Kubernetes-related file. In deploying file types, the rolling update is the, is the default one inside the Kubernetes environment. So rolling means, according to rolling strategy, it will deploy your uh, instances one by one. So otherwise, it will be a uh, outage, but it will deploy your environment um, pods one by one. In Canary release, let's say that you just implement a feature, experiment feature, and you just want to deploy this one to limit very limited users. Uh, let's say that you have, in your production environment, you have one zero, one zero uh, application. And it has three replicas, right? And you implemented your experimental feature and you tag it as 2.0, as you can see in the Docker image. And when you check the replicas, you will see only one. And the only difference between those two, the name of the deployments. But all the other tags, etc., cetera, are, are same. When you deploy those two deployments, you will see that the 25% of the request will go to the experimental feature, and the 75% of the request will go to the production-ready one. Let's say that there is no, you track the system, there is no exception within the one week, two weeks, etc. You can increase the level of the, the experimental one. So you can do it 50-50%, uh, 75-25, and then 100% of the experimental feature, and at the end of the day, you will see your production application will be 2.0 with the replicas 3. In the blue-green deployment, we, this, is the, this is the expensive one. So basically, we have completely cloned environment of the production environment. Uh, you deployed your features there, you did some internal test, and when you say, okay, this is, okay, uh, this is stable right now, you can just switch your uh, request to the uh, new one instead of the current one. <clears throat> so logging, uh, this is a Spring Boot log, output log. So in order to log this one, you can use two ways, node level and the cluster level logging. In node level, you simply log your uh, output into the, inside the node and you can log rotate them in the feature. But in cluster level logging, you have a daemon set. You have an agent to send your logs inside the node, specific node, to the center log management tool. <clears throat> So you can use different kind of technologies, gray log, AL key, et cetera. But let me provide an example about Humio. Humio is a log management tool central. Basically, when you create an account, you will have a, a deployment file, something like this. And when you apply this inside your Kubernetes environment, basically it will create a daemon set and it will try to ship all of your logs to the um, Humio central log management system. As you can see, it's using the fluent bits as a log shipper tool. <clears throat> and the final one is the APM. So you have different kind of monitoring tools and logging system, but when you, sometimes, if there is a problem, you cannot see them within the monitoring or the logging tools. So APM is the guy you need on this part. Um, basically, uh, you can use different kind of technologies, again, New Relic, AppDynamics, Dynatrix, or Zipkin for the uh, open source alternative. But um, <clears throat> I just wanted to provide you another example, uh, which is called Instana here. Uh, when you deploy this one into your Kubernetes environment, first it will create an infrastructure graph of your system. This is the first part of the uh, monitoring on the APM side. And the second part is the service mesh. This is very important because if there is an anomaly on your service, and if you can see the request coming from this unknown source, you can easily detect this one. So let's say that in information service, you have doubled your request in coming from other services. So who, who is this? You can see the uh, guilty guy from this uh, graph. And let's say that there is a problem inside the shop service. You can have a look at this graph and you can easily drill down the specific request. When you have a look at this graph, you will see there is a green one, there is a problem inside the Elasticsearch service, it introduces a latency to your system. Most probably you are trying to search something within an unindexed field, just an example. Again, if you have a problem inside your system, it can automatically create incidents integrated within your system. So there is a problem inside the Docker container memory, it will create an incident and you will be alarmed. So that's all. If you have questions, I can happily answer all of that.
Thank you. Uh, okay. Actually, the answer to your first question is uh, you can use, for example, Cystic or other companies, or we are using Quai to store our Docker registry, Docker images. Basically, they are doing a penetration test on the images in the DIFA. Yeah, yeah, they are, they are doing that. But you can use more advanced ones, for example, Cystic, which is the founder of the Wireshark. You can also have a look at that. But there are different kind of enterprise companies doing this one. And as a second one to monitoring the network, uh, again, you can use different kind of technologies like Cystic because they are doing low level network traffic by using the operating system level commands. You same namespace. Yeah, that's correct. But we have never used it because when we introduce the inspect tool inside our data plane, it will introduce a latency which is not expected on our system because Hazelcast is throughput is very important. When we introduce something, it will introduce latency, so we are not doing that. Okay. okay. Do we have time for questions? Yes. We have. Five minutes, okay. Nice. So. Uh, which method did you uh, prefer, prefer to uh, expose uh, external uh, TCP port? Uh, which uh, the service is like the uh, Mongo or uh, Rabbit or Redis and etc. to expose the outside uh, to internet. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, which method do you, did you prefer to expose uh, service? Okay, so custom you are TCP port for the custom TCP port. You, you mean the type of service load balancer, yes. load board? Yes. Okay. Board okay. Or okay. Not load balancer. Okay. So there are diff most according to technology. Uh, for example, on our case, as a case, we cannot use load balancer because you need to direct access to members. But let's say that you are using MongoDB and you just wanted to access MongoDB port directly. You can use node port for this. Uh, but keep in mind that, for example, you exposed uh, 27 or 20 to outside. When you use node port, uh, the only thing you need to know is the port. So when you say port, it will directly go to MongoDB service. This is a simple one. But there is another advanced one you can bind your port within your host environment, and it will be the static way to access this one. But my preference will be the not port. Okay. So you offer SaaS for your customers. I think it's a big issue for you to handle auto scaling. It is not an issue because it is the easiest one because we have Prometheus, we are collecting our Hazelcast metrics, and we have used memories and max memory. We always tracking this one. So if there is a threshold exceeded after the 80%, we automatically auto scale the Hazelcast cluster if customer selected auto scaled feature. What about the nodes? Uh, so if you are inside the AWS environment, if you are using COPS or something like that, you can enable the auto scaling feature. According to lots, you can trigger it. So if there is a huge memory usage, your nodes will auto automatically extend it, and if the the load is decreased and automatically shrinked to the current one. You can define your min and max node count within the Kubernetes installation. Okay. So communication from which point to which point? Yes. Ca the entry point of the customer to the uh, SX dedicated namespace of that customer. Okay, so when we deploy something, actually we deploy it inside the customer namespace. So uh, when you we are defining an ingress rule inside that namespace. That means when you type something inside the URL, it directly goes to that namespace uh, object, actually. Okay. Customer one and customer two. Uh -huh. uh, do you have different end, uh, load balancer endpoints? Okay, we are not using load balancer. We are trying to expose these services to the outside by using node port. So, 
for every customer, we have different ports. They are unique. So when you install something, actually we provide you a token. And when you apply this token to your URL, it automatically resolves which IP address is available for this port. And that's all. So port uniqueness is the key point here. One minute left. Any question? OK. Okay, we, we are pay-as-you-go system. So basically, again, we have a custom metric exporter in Prometheus, and we are tracking the used memory of the uh, Hazelcast. According to this usage, we are, uh, we are trying to collect all of these usages per a specific time interval, and we try to log this one inside the dedicated table. So at the end of the month, actually, we aggregate all of this data and try to charge it. We have something like one or uh, all uh, something like uh, one dollar per ten hours for a two gigabyte of one gigabyte of cluster. Who manages the whole stuff? Creating the new namespaces. Uh, okay. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. We 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 have microservices and we are using public client in order to operate this kind of thing. But if you have no complex system, you can use a Helm chart or something like that. But we have some custom solutions. We needed to use fabric client to, because we set up a, f a couple of configuration for each customer, and then we do deployment. That's why we are using fabric client in Java. OK, we are finished. And thank you again. And thank you, Sayin.